How did you start in your diving career? I was a Navy diver. I'm a second class diver. I went through a second class diving school in Hawaii. I had the best time of my life. <laughs> I got out of the Navy, went home, went out with a buddy of mine to drink some beer, and a girl came walking by, a beautiful figure. As she walked by, I said, come on over here and have a beer with me. She said, okay. After about 10 minutes, I said, I want to get married. She says, would you like to get married? She said, yes, I would. That evening, we made arrangements, and the next day, we left to get married. And still married? Still married. Now, we only had one argument. It started on the day we got married. That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a boat while I was in the Navy and rebuilt it with the idea of going out and diving for abalone. I did that. I took my new wife and we went out there, but she didn't like it at all. And I had problems with the boat. I was always mad because things were always going to break it. And I could see that this marriage was not going to survive. So we quit that and we went on to Morro Bay and joined the Black Fleet. Really, they were a whole bunch of really good GIs, mostly the Marines. Work hard, I knew no end to it. They weren't very good when it came to building things, and that was my department, so it all worked out. I'd help them and they'd help me. I was diving in Abalone in Morro Bay and I didn't like the place. The weather was bad, cold, windy, foggy. So I ran the boat down here and I put the boat up for sale. And then I found that I could rebuild some of these old masks and so forth for the, the uh, Abalone divers here. Right around the 1950s when Abalone were booming, Oil exploration started to parallel, and they were drilling for oil out here in California on the cliffs of Summerland. So they soon started offshore oil drilling, and they have to fix and maintain their equipment. So what better resource than having the local abalone divers who are used to working underwater? It's the migration of this group of abalone divers into oil field diving, which is th the real big story then the success of oil field diving expands. Oil companies want to keep going deeper and deeper because the continental shelf in Santa Barbara, it's, it's very close to shore, so the water gets deep real quick out here. You can't breathe air over uh, 200 feet before getting goofy. It's like being drunk. When you get to that depth beyond 132 feet, it becomes really, really toxic. That doesn't happen when you breathe helium. Everybody understood at that point that if you're going to go deep, you had to go on helium. So Wilson had a knowledge that with helium, you could go really deep. And so he developed this helium demand system in an abalone helmet. Danny Wilson was an abalone diver. It proved that it's going to work. He went out Tweedy Islands out here, made a dive to 400 feet, and it almost killed him. He did what's called the bounce dive. Bounce dive means he just went down, touched bottom, and then came back up. The extreme pressure at 400 feet caused the gasket between the breastplate and the helmet to swell up, and it put a wedge lock on the helmet. Normally, we can twist these things off, but because it swelled up so much and created this wedge effect, they could not get the helmet off. And his wife, Dorothy, was on the boat at the time and got extremely upset so they had to go and take the actual breastplate and the brails off the helmet to get it off. It's very rudimentary, very seat of the pants. He could have killed himself, but that's what these guys did. They took risks back in the day. After Dan Wilson died in 1962 and the development of commercial uh, mixed gas uh, pioneered here, then Associated needed to build equipment to be able to do helium diving. And Kirby was uh, recruited to build that. He developed a commercial helium recirculator, which then went on to be basically his calling card for his career. And in so doing, I changed a lot of designs around so I get better and better and better all the time. But then Associated went away, and I was stuck 
with nothing but my hand tools. So I rented a little shop at Santa Barbara Airport and started building helmets. And so what he did was provide a supply of equipment where any of us, if you wanted to go deep and dive helium, Bob would sell you a helmet. There's a lot of people doing a lot of groundbreaking things, but he was the guy that was making the equipment. And when Bev comes along... I saw Bev Morgan walking down the dock. I said, would you like a job? And he says, well, I, I can't. He says, I have to go get back on my Eberle boat as I have a payment coming up on my house. And I said, well, how would $600 help? He says, for what? I says, for you to working for me for six weeks. But he was easy to work with, very, very intelligent and anxious to do good work. They were very, very, very different, like a chalk and cheese type of different. Bob was very traditional. With Bev, his style of life was Ferraris, you know, him and David Crosby doing all this crazy stuff. The fact that Bob and Bev were both divers really gave them a supreme advantage in the industry. Other people were trying to build diving helmets but they weren't divers. And they could come up with dumb designs. For instance, when you put a diving helmet on, it's got to fit and it has to be comfortable. Now you say, well, it's, it's not bad. There's a little screw right here, but you know, I put my head against it once in a while, it's all right. Come about two hours later, tell me about that screw. They knew what divers needed and what worked and what wouldn't work for commercial divers. The thing that turns is Bev's knowledge of laying fiberglass from his surfing days. We produce the helmet that changes the whole direction of everything, which is the Superlight 17. So they introduced that and became basically an overnight success.